Uh, the original task I thought I had was to look at both RNA and microRNA expression levels. But you know, really, if you start to look at what people are doing with microRNAs, it's not that different uh, from what they're doing with mRNAs. So uh, what I thought I would do is take you back to before the dawn of time and uh, just display northern blots. So here's a cave painting showing how northern blots work. Uh, but basically, what you do is you extract RNA from a cell. And the reason you're interested in the RNA is that we all think about the progression from DNA to RNA to protein, and proteins really being the functional units in the cell. But assaying proteins has turned out to be fairly difficult. But assaying RNAs, or the levels of RNA, is a really good surrogate for looking at the proteins, in part because it's easier to measure. So there have been tools and techniques for measuring RNA uh, expression levels. But basically, what you do is you take RNA from a cell. You uh, take that RNA, and you run it through a, a gel using electrophoresis. You pull that RNA onto a membrane, and then you probe that membrane with fluorescently labeled probes. And the result of that is a hybridization pattern. So here's a more modern uh, version of that same uh, cave painting. And then here's an example of a really ugly northern blot where you have different genes that are hybridized, and you often distinguish them by their sizes um, in different samples. Or uh, here's a, a really, a, probably a, a slightly nicer example, although it tends to be washed out. And there are challenges with trying to normalize the data to adjust it so that what you see in each sample can actually be compared. Uh, but then uh, what you'll see down on the bottom is the most common tool for displaying gene expression levels, um, the evil, evil Excel bar graph. Um, and this one, they actually did a little bit where they put um, some error bars on here or showing some levels of uncertainty, and then flag some things that they thought were significantly different. Uh, but this was really the way people tend to think about looking at RNAs. They look at individual levels, and they want to know how those levels are changing over time, or how those levels are changing between samples, or between different phenotypic groups. And so this was really the starting point. But eventually, people recognized that there were more quantitative ways of looking at gene expression levels. And so sort of the pre-modern era was the development of quantitative RT-PCR. And sort of the first steps are, are omitted here. But what one would do is extract RNA from the cell, take that RNA, and transcribe it into a complementary DNA using reverse transcriptase. And then that complementary DNA is one uh, a DNA to which you can design uh, a set of uh, uh, primers. And then what you do is you amplify that DNA in sequential rounds of PCR. And what happens is, as you start amplifying that uh, initial cDNA, uh, you get, in each round, an exponential increase in the amount of cDNA that's present. And if you can detect the presence, actually, of double-stranded nucleic acids, you can detect the presence. Uh, and quantitate the presence of um, the starting RNA, making some assumptions, of course, about how that RNA gets turned into cDNA. Uh, but essentially, what one does then with quantitative PCR is one measures uh, what are called CT curves. And basically, you're looking at an estimate of the concentration by looking at some molecule that binds to and fluoresces in this double-stranded DNA. Um, and you're looking at the fluorescent output. And essentially, what these two curves are showing is that there's a relationship between when this curve crosses a particular threshold and the amount of starting uh, nucleic acid. And so uh, people have argued and, and demonstrated with spiking experiments that it is reasonably linear if you look at these CT curves. And so in fact, what you measure, here's another example, um, is data for expression of individual genes. And then what you go back to is um, Excel plot showing, a bar graph showing um, expression levels. Now, I always get really terrified when I look at these. Excel is the devil's tool, even though it's man's friend. And I have lots and lots of stories, as, as I'm sure you all do, about Excel being really awful. But my favorite story is about a year and a half ago, I had someone come to me who was working on looking at um, uh, gene expression in stem cells. And if you know anything about stem cells, one of the key genes for looking at stem cells is a gene called OCT4. And if you put OCT4 into Excel, since Excel is much, much smarter than you are, it knows that when you write OCT4, you really mean OCT space 4. 
and that that's a date, and it converts it to its binary integer format dating back to January 1st, 1904, and then all the subsequent analyses you run crash because Excel is smarter than you. Uh, but what we really wanted to do as a community is get away from things that are smarter than us. Um, and so uh, people compared RT-PCR to other methods, got very confident in it. And then really I think the landmark paper in starting to look beyond individual RNAs was a paper published by uh, Roland Samoygi and his colleagues uh, back in 1998. And what they looked at was rat brain and they did uh, a series of quantitative RT-PCR experiments. So this is just a num small number of the genes and they looked at the individual profiles of those genes over time. So this was a nice time course experiment and to make people happy at the time they looked at uh, uh, Excel bar plots. Uh, but what was really interesting was they started looking at large numbers of these genes in different functional classes and they actually produced what I, as far as I can tell, is the first heat map representing gene expression levels in RNAs. And they did a lot of other things. They were looking actually at patterns of expression over time. And so what you see over here are different waves, what they called waves, where the expression levels came on early and then went down or came on later or peaked at later times. And so they identified these different patterns. And they really did it in sort of an ad hoc way. They didn't have any computational methods for doing that. But they picked out what they thought were these different patterns um, and then looked at the patterns and, and looked at the relationships between the patterns building dendrograms using um, the distance between different uh, genes in these profiles. And um, then really, I, I thought, created sort of a clever map showing when genes in different categories turn on and off um, as this time course progressed. And so in a lot of ways, this is probably the single most inventive and um, revolutionary paper in terms of displaying uh, gene expression levels I've ever read or ever seen. There are actually two papers by this group. This is from a, a second ISM, I think, or PSB paper. But they really had some, some interesting ways in thinking about this large scale data. Um, the real birth, though, of clustering and heat maps was probably a paper by John Weinstein and his colleagues. And what they were doing is actually not looking at gene expression levels, although in subsequent papers they quickly realized that they could. But what they were doing is they were looking at different drugs and the effects of those drugs on viability of cell lines um, and looking at correlations between uh, different compounds and um, different targets and their effects on different cell lines. And they had little hierarchical clustering dendrograms showing the relationship. But it was really, I think, the first time people, anyone, anywhere had combined hierarchical clustering and heat maps. Of course, if I asked any of you if you've ever read any of those two papers, the answer is probably no, uh, because what really happened about this time is microarrays burst onto the scene and people got very excited about microarrays. And history is written by the victors, or as I tell my students, those who write software that other people use. And so if you ask anyone where the first application of clustering was, and heat maps, it was actually this paper by Mike Eisen and Pat Brown, uh, Paul Spellman and David Botstein, and another related paper that appeared about the same time, in which they looked at yeast and yeast during the cell cycle and actually showed that you could see different temporal patterns of expression um, in yeast. And the real advance uh, and the real impact on the community was not in doing clustering, because it really had been done before, not in producing heat maps, but in producing a tool that one could use to actually generate clusters. And so there was a proliferation of clustering tools that appeared everywhere. Um, and this is also the start of tormenting people who are red, green, colorblind. Uh, but it was really a proliferation of, of tools and techniques. And so truth is actually determined by the person giving the talk. So I'll talk about the clustering tools we produce. We have this tool called MEV. And I only want to show it not because it's the best tool, although it is, uh, but you know, it sort of captures the essence of what we as a community have, have come to realize as being really important. So now it's not red, green, but I picked blue, yellow. You can pick different color palettes and almost any tool you can pick different color palettes. The color palettes that people use are almost a religious choice and you have people fighting over them. I'm here at the Broad, so I probably should have made this blue and pink because that's their official color palette. Um, and if I get smitten or smote or whatever the <laughs> verb is out in the lobby, you'll know why. But you know, here's a blue-green histogram or uh, a heat map, and they're hierarchical clustering now not only of samples but 
of genes. And one of the things everyone is very interested in, of course, is in looking at these data and actually correlating them back with different phenotypes. So what I did up here is just add different bars showing um, the different phenotypes. And you can't read it over here, of course, because um, the font is too small to project. But essentially, each one of these phenotypes is identified by a different color-coded bar. And uh, then what you can do in, in many, many tools is actually take these color-coded bars and link them to other types of data. So in this case, I have a principal components analysis in which I'm looking at the two different major phenotypic groups in the study, or at least two phenotypic groups, the, the blue and green ones over here. And in, in most of these tools, what you really end up doing is looking at the data, performing a statistical analysis after performing um, some unsupervised analysis. Uh, and you combine a variety of different techniques. You select gene sets. And eventually, you look at some meta-analysis, including looking at which uh, go terms or pathways are overrepresented um, in your data set using a whole variety of different techniques. And a great deal of thought and a great deal of effort in the community has really gone into trying to produce different methods and different techniques that would allow you to address uh, just a whole series of questions along this pathway. And if I look at MEV as an example, um, it has probably 30 different algorithms for analyzing data that represent just a small sampling of a huge number of algorithms that have been produced over time. And essentially, every single one of the algorithms that's represented in this software, which is a Java-based tool, um, is represented in other things like Bioconductor. Uh, where there are just a whole host of different ways of, of displaying these data. Um, but the real question is, you know, what is the most useful way of displaying data? And, and a lot of times, it often comes back to just looking at these heat maps. Because while the heat maps are not necessarily that informative for telling us anything about the underlying mechanism, what they allow us to do is to actually see patterns in the data. And a big part of what we're looking to do in analyzing a lot of this data is to visualize it in a way that we can present it back to individuals uh, who are analyzing the data themselves so that they can actually tease out what they believe the underlying biology is. So in linking different tools together and linking them together graphically and visually, it actually gives you the opportunity to start to explore the relationships. And, and the real challenge I think we have in analyzing genomic data and RNA expression data as an example is really the fact that when we start to look at these data, we don't necessarily have enough samples to be able to arrive at a statistically significant and a very, very strongly supported result. And so what we're often looking for are patterns that we can take back to the laboratory and use for further experiments. So these large-scale visualization experiments often come back to a set of hypotheses that are then taken back to the lab and tested using older techniques like quantitative RT-PCR or followed up by other experiments that try to delve into um, the, the nature of gene expression profiles. So microarray profiling really, I think, represented a renaissance uh, in terms of looking at genes and gene functions. And there's just been a huge amount of data that's been generated. Uh, if you look and sort of sum all of these up, there are well over a million arrays worth of data in, in a variety of different public resources, Array Express, Geo, um, Japanese resource, a Stanford database. Um, and what has really happened is there's been an explosion in the number of assays that have been done. And if you just look at sort of a conservative estimate, this was a paper that I, or a little news feature that was in Nature, I don't know, five or six years ago. And I apologize for the red on green. It, when I copied this slide from somewhere else, it popped in. Uh, so I, I want to torment the colorblind, too. But um, if you look at this, you know, it's well over a half a billion dollars worth of microarray assays. It's a conservative estimate that have been put into the public domain and that are readily accessible and readily, readily available. And so people have really tried very hard to develop tools to make these data accessible and queryable. And uh, there are a lot of tools that can download data from these resources. But uh, one of the, the resources that I really like is EBI's Expression Atlas. I mean, I really think it's probably the best consolidation of gene expression levels. Um, and what you can do is query this data in two different ways. You can look for individual studies uh, that are, are making specific comparisons. So if you're interested in breast cancer and you're, if you're interested in studies that compare estrogen receptor positive to negative breast cancer, you can pull those out. But the, the main use case that most biologists have if you talk to them 
is a simple question. What are my genes doing? Or what is my gene of interest doing across multiple samples? And so I, I think this is where Expression Atlas really excels. So here I'm looking at a particular gene, AKT1. I have from different data sets the expression in different tissues. And then in each one of those data sets, color uh, coded by phenotype, and the phenotypes differ, but color coded by phenotypes, I have the representative expression levels ordered in a really nice way. And all of this is something you can drill into and get more access to. So there's really a, a lot of effort that's been put into building tools that give us access to these data. But ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is to take the data and make sense of them. And a big part of what the availability of arrays is done is really driven an effort to try to understand fundamental biology. And I work at Dana-Farber, we're a cancer institute, so a big part of the work that we do in understanding biology is focused on understanding sort of the progression of disease and using genomics and genomic technologies to really look at the range of different applications to understanding a person's genetic risk to detecting disease early, to stratifying patients, to staging disease, to using this information with other profiles to select the best treatment options uh, that'll improve outcome and ultimately give people a better quality of life. But what's really been interesting to me over the past few years is just the fundamental shift in the field away from these array-based technologies. And they're still widely used, and they're still going to be widely used for years to come. But what we've really seen is that sequencing has moved in. And for almost every one of these applications, instead of looking at RNA expression levels on chips or genetic uh, variation on chips, what we've been doing is looking at gene expression levels or sequence variants using sequencing technologies. And the beauty of these sequencing technologies is actually that the data is much, much richer. It's really expanded the universe of applications that we can think about. Um, so what we used to do expression profiling, uh, what we can now do is actually do that same expression profiling using sequence-based techniques. But while we're doing that, get some information about uh, mutations and mutations in coding sequences and loss of heterozygosity or functional loss of heterozygosity. If we simply sequence the exons, what we get is information about the exons and their relative sequence. But one of my students uh, has actually gone back and shown that you can use the exon sequence data to estimate copy number variation. And so I, I think more and more we're going to see the field moving towards dealing with these assays and to trying to make sense out of the gene expression data or other data that we collect using these sequence-based techniques, whether for RNAs or microRNAs, uh, because they provide us a much richer source of data. Today, the cost of generating data using sequence-based technologies is about a factor of two, maybe a little less, maybe a little more than using arrays. But I can guarantee you within the next year, it's going to be less expensive or at least cost competitive with array-based techniques. So what that really means is that we've started to go back to looking at the sequence and this, uh, the expression of genes, not just in the context of their overall expression levels, but in fact, to be able to ask real questions about what those sequences represent in terms of the expression levels of different transcripts and different exons. And so this is everybody's favorite genome browser, the UC Santa Cruz genome browser. What you can see are two different gene models up here um, with um, uh, two different, I guess, exonic structures, or maybe not, I'm not sure, but at least two different three prime ends for these gene models. And uh, what you can see are the sequences themselves stacked up with exon junctions or intron junctions represented. And what everyone is trying to do now is to develop tools to estimate not just the expression levels, but the expression levels of individual transcripts. And to identify things like uh, alternative exons and alternative five prime ends uh, that may be present in these data, but to really explore the structure of gene expression and gene sequencing, um, uh, by mapping these back not to representative genes the way arrays do, but really by looking at individual transcripts and trying to make those estimates. So there's just a whole proliferation of browsers. I showed you the Santa Cruz browser that everybody uses. Since I'm at the Broad, I have to show you their IGV, a second-rate browser. Um, now I'm really in danger. Um, I'll show you Victor's browser, uh, Victor Christikoff. He has a poster um, with a browser that we developed. I promised that we would never, ever, ever develop a browser, ever, ever. 
And then we started looking at available browsers and realized that none of them were any good and as good as what Victor could develop. And so Victor developed a browser that allows you to show multiple tracks combining. We used to call it the Franken browser because it combined parts of different browsers um, to really try to create a tool that we thought display the essential features of what we have to do. But they're just browsers everywhere. There are probably more browsers than people on Earth. Um, and so you can have your choice of browsers. You can choose a really good one or a really awful one, like this one. But um, you know, eventually, what you're going to end up with is data. And what we've seen time and again is that when we start looking at this RNA-seq data, the question almost everyone asks us is, for my gene of interest, what are the relative expression levels of different isoforms of that gene? And so we're back to actually displaying the same data using Excel and other tools to make histograms and bar charts. Uh, but we're really trying to integrate those data, and I think a lot of people are, with other sources of data and information. And again, if we look at individual genes, what we'd like to know is, is much information about those genes, information about their expression, and in this case, this is mutational data, um, and then the structure of the genes based on RNA sequencing data and other sources of information. So uh, the community is actually moving more and more towards developing these types of tools. But at the end of the day, what we come down to is often displaying the summary results at the level of heat maps, because that's really become the standard in the community. And we haven't progressed that much farther. There are other people, though, who have been looking at ways of displaying data. And I at least want to highlight a few of these. So the, the project or the, the, the approach I'm going to tell you about is actually one that was pioneered by Sui Wong, who used to be here in town at Brigham and Women's. He's now at University of Calgary in Canada, but he's moving to the Institute for Systems Biology sometime soon. He was actually interested in a very interesting problem um, in gene expression. And this really goes back to Stuart Kaufman in the 1990s and early part of um, this century, in which Kaufman was looking at gene expression and really thinking about genes interacting through complex networks. And basically, he showed that if networks have certain properties which are similar to those of small world networks or scale-free networks, um, and if you looked at a Boolean uh, model of gene expression, what he showed was that those models actually produce attractors. They're self-organizing critical models uh, in which you have attractors or stable states. And that really sort of captures our understanding of gene expression in cells. If we look at expression levels, not all levels of each individual gene is possible in every cell. And what we see are characteristic expression profiles for different cell types or different tissues that are represented by these attractors. And so the idea that you can produce attractors just by looking at interactions between gene expression levels was really attractive. And it sort of corresponds with the idea that in humans, there are about 250 stable cell types. So what Sui Wong did was he actually looked at an experiment in which uh, he looked at promyelocytes, the HL60 cell line. Um, and looked at them differentiating into neutrophil-like cells, either stimulated by DMSL or all transretinoic acid. He used Affymetrix HU6800 arrays, profiled them over a course of about six days, and then produced a little software tool he called Jetty, which is a self-organizing map, heat map. Um, and what this really shows is sort of the divergence of these trajectories and their convergence back to a, a common expression profile. And we did, we took his data and we actually did a principal components analysis and showed that we have these two divergent then essentially convergent trajectories. So if you look at the data, in fact, what you can really see um, using this kind of visualization is some apparent support for the idea that there are attractors. Uh, Jess Moore and I actually looked at this data and we said, well, there's another way of looking at it instead of thinking about two sort of divergent trajectories, what you might imagine is that you have a core differentiation pathway and then transient perturbations representing the effects of DMSO or all transretinoic acid and essentially showed that you could pull those out. So here's the observed trajectory. Like with many papers published in the literature, we could never reproduce his figure even using his data and his software. This was the best we could do. Um, and so you can see the trajectory sort of diverging uh, and then converging and looking more or less similar after seven days. Uh, here's the transient trajectories, and you can tell they look very, very different, uh, but sort of converge towards the end. And then the core trajectories actually look very, very similar um, over time, really representing the fact that instead of just having a random walk around gene expression state space, there may in fact be evolutionarily selected 
trajectories. And if I had more time and was giving a science talk, I'd tell you how we took that idea and sort of extended it. But what we've really been thinking about and what a lot of people in the community have been thinking about is taking data like this and actually using it to understand the functional roles that these individual genes play. And if we have to look at the biggest challenge in looking at RNA expression, it's actually trying to map functional roles back to the genome. And there are lots of different ways to displaying networks and building networks and building protein-protein interaction networks. Uh, and these are networks curated from the literature by people at Ingenuity. Uh, and I can tell you they're all awful and they're all wrong, but they're all incredibly useful because what we really want to know is, in this case, what genes are being expressed or, um, in the context of this project, what are the variance levels of individual genes and populations, uh, both in a, a control set of cell lines and then in different neuropsychiatric diseases. And again, if I were talking about science, I would tell you about the role that variation plays and how one of the things that we're discovering is that in biology, we tend to ask one question, which is if I compare two phenotypic groups, and I look at those groups, the fundamental biostatistics question is, is the mean of any measurement in those two groups large? Is the difference in the means large independent uh, relative to the variance? And the question we've been asking with gene expression data is a, is a different question, but one that we're finding very informative in this case. Is the variance large between phenotypic groups independent of the mean? And if I had to tell you where to look for the next breakthroughs in displaying gene expression data, our group and a bunch of other groups around the world are really starting to look at this question about variance and the variance of gene expression. And we're struggling with tools and metaphors for presenting and describing these data. Um, but ultimately, what we come back to is displaying all of this data using heat maps. So despite all of the, the, the approaches that people have been using, the fundamental tool we have for representing the underlying data is often uh, just heat maps with color codes to try to represent the individual phenotypes. Of course, there are a lot of other things I haven't talked about, like uh, looking at where genes are expressed. And again, there, uh, there's a whole host of tools and visualization tools, and I think other people who do microscopy would be much better suited to talk about looking at gene expression in the context of physical positions within cells or within organs or within tissues or within individuals. Uh, but, uh, and it's so interesting, there are two Gs there. But um, you know, ultimately, what we'd really like to do is not only know what the patterns are in individual cells or individual cell types, uh, but what the global patterns of gene expression are. And again, I think we're struggling with, uh, with uh, tools for displaying this data. But I really have to come back to the fact that what we have to think about, and I'll try to wrap up because my time is running short, uh, but what we have to think about are ways of displaying the data in uh, the context of what we know about underlying biological systems. That looking at just displaying data in and of itself is never going to get us very far because the data is ultimately linked back to phenotypes. So my colleagues and I at Dana-Farber are part of a large uh, consortium called uh, the LGRC, the Lung Genomics Research Consortium. It was a project funded by a GO grant. We're just a little bit more than a year into the project, and we are essentially the data coordinating center for this project. We've built a site uh, to provide access to our colleagues and soon, I hope, to the rest of the community where we have a LIMS for tracking samples. We have a data download portal for downloading individual data sets or data on individual genes. We have a tool for exploring clinical data. We have a gene-based catalog. Uh, Victor's genome browser is built in here, some analysis tools, and then uh, ways of semantically exploring links between data. I just want to highlight, too, because we've really thought a lot not about how we as bioinformatics scientists use data, but how our colleagues use data. And so the way in which we uh, see people using data is actually in only two use cases. The first use case that we developed in developing this portal is the one that almost every biology, biologist you talk to asks. I have my favorite gene. Can you tell me what my gene is doing? And so what we did is we built a portal where you can look for an individual gene, and here's VEGF. Everybody loves Google because Google is man's friend or Satan's tool, depending on your perspective. But what Google does and everybody expects now is a text complete function. So if I was typing in VEGF, it would try to complete that. It would limit the search down here to things that are relevant. It would limit Go terms and pathways over here. 
But people are used to market baskets. And so what you do is you go and you load up your market basket with genes, and then you download data or launch a browser to look at the expression levels or features of those individual genes. And this is just that profile that I showed you earlier. What one of the other main use cases that we arrived at was not looking at individual genes or pathways, which are just an extension of those genes, but looking at clinical data. So what we had to do was organize our clinical data so we have a tool that essentially allows you to come in and construct cohorts by looking at well-structured clinical data and saying, all right, I want all the patients in this study who have COPD, who are non-smoking Hispanic males between the ages of 30 and 35, and have these radiographic characteristics based on their x-rays. And I want to write, put those into a cohort and then compare them to all the smoking Hispanic males with COPD between ages 30, uh, 35 and 45. Uh, who have the same radiographic characteristics. And so we have a little tool for exploring um, those data and, and very simply creating cohorts and then launching analyses. And this is just a mock-up. I, I couldn't get a screen grab of our actual output um, in time, but just launching an analysis that pulls back um, uh, a rational set of choices um, for algorithms and the results of their application to each one of the data sets we've been, collect, uh, being, uh, we've been collecting. So um, expression analysis has really evolved over time in terms of the quantities of data that we've generated. But the tools that we have for visualizing it, aside from genome browsers, which are fairly old, and heat maps, which are reasonably old, haven't advanced all that much. And I think there's great opportunity uh, within our community and within this community to try to take that data farther. So I like to use quotes in, ex uh, in talks, and this is one of my favorite talks. My background is in physics, so I always quote physicists because, as you know, they're the smartest people on Earth. Um, this is from Enrico Fermi. He said, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. After listening to your lecture, I am still confused, but at a higher level. Um, so I hope my little survey of history has left you highly confused. But I just want to leave you with a little anecdote to tell you that genomics is here to stay. Uh, June, July, August last year, I went down to Brisbane. I spent three months in Brisbane. I arrived with my family. We rented a car. I came home with the car. My wife took the car keys out of my hand. So if your house is like my house, you'll understand. The car keys disappeared, and for the rest of the winter or summer, depending on your perspective, I rode the bus. And my second day on the bus, I realized genomics is here to stay. Uh, I saw a sign that says, spitting is unacceptable. <laughs> Bus operators are now equipped with DNA kits to assist with the apprehension of offenders. So welcome to my genomic world, um, and I'd be happy to answer questions for as long as you'd like.